thank you all for being here. For those of you uh, who don't know me, my name is Dave Eldman. I am the interim executive director here at the San Francisco Camera Work, and we are particularly excited uh, to have a, a great group of people here. Uh, as we get started, you know, one of the awesome things about being online is we're able to be with people from all over the country and the world, but we're a San Francisco organization. It's in the name, San Francisco Camera Work. So we want to pause and acknowledge that we are on the ancestral lands of the Ohlone people here in the Bay Area. And as we do that, we want to welcome you for being here. We're excited that you can uh, join us. Uh, and I know you're eager uh, to hear Ken Light speak, so I'm going to keep my uh, comments pretty brief. Uh, we're excited you're here for a couple reasons. The first is this is the first event of our 2020 online book and zine fair. Uh, it's one of our favorite events that we've done for the last three years. Usually we've done it in our physical space and you can meet a lot of artists, buy their books on the spot. This year, we're continuing that tradition with a series of events uh, that are beginning tonight with our talk uh, with Ken Light. You can actually join us here um, uh, uh, tomorrow as we'll have a talk with uh, Delphine Fawundu and uh, Orly Malka. And we'll be doing this all week. And it culminates with an event on December 17th. We're going to be using a new platform and we'll have a lot of artists joining us. Christina and I are still figuring it out, but we're so excited that you can join us for the Book and Zine Fair. Ken, we're glad that you can join us as we kick this off. And Christina Graber, as ever, I'm going to give you a shout out because you've been uh, uh, supporting the Book and Zine Fair for a long time and we're grateful for your efforts. The other initiative I want to call out, and then I'll stop talking, this is the season of giving. You may have received some emails from us. We are a nonprofit organization. And as such, we rely on your support and your membership to bring you programs like this. And we've just launched uh, a new donate page. And uh, uh, if you are interested in supporting work like this at the end of the year, as you're considering giving, uh, we hope that you will come and visit us at Camera Work. You can see our upcoming events. You can become a member and you can give all of that at our website, sfcamerawork.org. One last thing, we will be recording this event tonight. So if you'd like to participate later with questions, we would love it if you turned your camera on and joined us, but you certainly don't have to. You can also submit questions uh, through uh, the chat of Zoom and we'll ask those questions of uh, Ken later on. But we just wanted to give you a heads up on that. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Ken Light. Ken is a professor of photojournalism at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and has been a friend of camera work for a long time. And we're delighted to have him here to discuss his work and two really powerful books with us this evening. Ken, thanks for being here. I'll hand it to you. Thank you so much, Dave. I really appreciate it. And yes, wow, it's scary to think how long I have uh, been part of camera work's family. Uh, wow, from almost the very beginning, uh, going to your space and watching you move around the city uh, and, um, you, the work that you guys do in the Bay Area is so, so important. And I hope that people will uh, support your continuing uh, exhibition and programs and also uh, visit the website where they can buy the books uh, that are part of the, the book and, and zine program. Um, so I'm gonna talk tonight, um, let me share my screen. I'm gonna to talk tonight about um, two of my books, uh, both of which are part of the um, book and zine event that Camera Work is sponsoring. Uh, What's Going On, uh, which is uh, my work as, an early, as a young photographer from 1969 to 1974, and a new book that was just published by TBW called Midnight La Frontera, uh, which is uh, work that I did along the border. And, and talk about how I came to these projects, um, a little bit about how I came to photography um, and how these, these projects evolved um, in, in, very, in very different ways. Um, so this is me in 1958. Uh, I grew up, uh, I was born in the Bronx. Uh, my uh, grandfather had a, a furniture store in Spanish Harlem and my parents, uh, when I was three, moved out to Long Island and my sister will recognize herself. She's right next to me in the, in the front. Um, and, I, and I guess part of my work comes out of this era that I, that I grew up in. Um, I, had a, I had a small little camera, which was kind of the, 
the idiot camera of the day, film camera, actually used 120 film, which is kind of funny to think that I'm still using 120 film. Um, but, it, but it was in the era when, um, you know, we were, we were out in Long Island. These are not my pictures, but it just gives you a sense of the environment that, that I uh, came out of. Uh, we, we grew up in uh, East Meadow, which was a town next to Levittown, which was the first American suburbs built after World War II. They were originally potato fields. And so there were a lot of mosquitoes. And uh, we had what was called the fog machine, which used to go through our neighborhood spraying DDT, which as you can see, kids used to run through. No one, no one knew what DDT was about. And you, if you can read the sign, it says powerful insecticide, harmless to humans. Um, so this was the era of the civil rights uh, protests. Uh, I, I was a young kid, but observant of this. This is of course a wonderful picture by Danny Lyon. Um, the threat of the nuclear bomb, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, the assassination of uh, John F. Kennedy. Uh, this is a powerful photograph by Richard Avedon. Um, the assassination of Malcolm X. Uh, of course, the Vietnam War and this amazing photograph made by Eddie Adams. Um, and, and so these were the moments, these were the pictures, uh, these were the political influences that I grew up with and observed and was very conscious of. And in 1969, um, I was 18 years old and uh, about to go off to college. And uh, yes, I went to Woodstock, but I did not have a camera. Um, we also that year had the moon landing. Um, so the, again, these were all the things that, that uh, influenced me. Um, and I think that one of the things I say about this work in particular now, um, and I've had this and, and I've had this discussion with numerous people, um, anyone watching will see the parallels between the late 60s and today, between Nixon and Trump, between John Mitchell and William Barr, and between the social unrest of the past and the present. Um, it was the era of film. Um, I used a Nikon F uh, camera. Um, manual camera, you had a handheld light meter. So all the pictures you're seeing were shot on film and you know you used the light meter to set the exposure. Um, and I just, um, I, I described to Dave earlier when we were talking, um, I, I went to college in 69 in Ohio, Ohio University. Um, and I started as a political organizer work, working against the Vietnam War and against racism and against the various different movements, the feminist movement, the Black Panther movement um, that were growing out of uh, 67 and 68 um, that were still very, very powerful. Um, and then I had always been interested in photography. My dad was an amateur photographer and I began to photograph the things around me. Um, I, I had absolutely no sense of uh, what I was doing in terms of creating a body of work or telling a story, but just being kind of observant of, of this period. Um, free concerts. Um, in 1969, um, I helped organize and photographed and went and photographed the new mobilization march in Washington, DC. And I, and I love this pen is one of my favorite pins that I collected, which was designed by Alexander Calder. Um, which a lot of people don't know. Um, and these movements were, were huge um, and hundreds of thousands of people took, took part. Um, and photography um, became very, a very, very important part of um, the political activities that people were involved in, partly because um, unlike today, I mean, I guess the difference between today uh, and back then um, is um, we had the mainstream media, we had Walter Cronkite, and we had, you know, the New York Times and major newspapers were still publishing. We did not have Fox News, uh, but we did have underground newspapers. And so young people, and if you really look at this picture, and I, and I often like to talk about this picture with my students, I say, you know, if this, if this was 2020, instead of seeing fingers up in the air, you would see cell phones. Um, so there's a very different experience for people during this period in terms of witnessing their own world um, and participating in, in protest. Um, 
And the mainstream media really saw us, um, those people who are fighting for progressive uh, issues, um, whether it was um, racism or the feminist movement, um, the anti-war movement, uh, they saw rock and roll, they saw the drug culture, people smoking marijuana and doing other drugs as being uh, de dangerous enemies. Um, and this was the mainstream press. And so uh, we developed uh, a huge movement of underground newspapers. Um, and at its height, there were about 650 underground newspapers published all, all over the United States. And um, those moments that we observed as photographers uh, were, were so important in sharing the experience we were having and what we were observing. Um, and so in 1970, and really I would say this was the moment in which I kind of um, decided, I don't know, decided. Um, I, I often say to my students, you know, the great thing about photography is you can wake up in the morning and say you're a photographer and you, and you are. Um, unlike waking up in the morning and saying you're a dentist or a brain surgeon. Um, and so it really was this moment in, in uh, 1970, uh, August 29th, 1970, um, it was a moment in which Nixon secretly invaded Cambodia. Um, and that during the Vietnam War, and they bombed, they began bombing Cambodia along the, what was the spine of Vietnam, trying to stop the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong from infiltrating into the South during the war. Um, and this secret of the bombing was very short-lived. Uh, the media reported it and the campuses all over America exploded with, with um, indignation and protest. Um, and one of those very large protests was at Ohio State University in Columbus. And that protest was not only brought about by uh, the war, it was also brought about by the fact that Ohio State did not wanna have a feminist studies program. They did not wanna have a black studies program. Um, they wanted things to be as they always were and the students had been agitating and the Cambodian invasion just kind of blew the lid off uh, the campus. Um, I was in Athens, Ohio. I hitchhiked up to Columbus the next day. The National Guard had been called out as you can see um, and they spent the day pretty much um, trying to quell the students protesting. Um, throwing tear gas um, and arresting as many people as they could. Um, shortly after I took this picture, um, I was grabbed by two highway patrol officers uh, and handcuffed um, and, and brought to the police van. Um, and I said, I'm a journalist and I had a press pass on my jacket and they ripped it off my jacket ripped it up into little pieces and threw it up in the air and said, you're not a journalist anymore. Um, and took me to jail with about 300 other people, um, was, was fingerprinted and mugged, uh, had a mug shot made. They took my camera and my film. Um, and when I got out of jail uh, the next day, uh, they handed me back a bag with my film in it, uh, which was kind of remarkable. Um, I hitchhiked back to Athens, developed the film, um, I was just really learning how to make prints. Um, so I had some colleagues who helped me make, make the prints. Um, and I sent the prints off to Liberation News Service. And this is actually my press pass uh, from 1970 uh, from Liberation News Service. So Liberation News Service was the, the kind of associated press of, of underground newspapers. And every week they sent out a printed packet uh, the photographs were screened so a newspaper could simply cut out the picture and paste it into their layout and that would that would be published um, and these photographs went all over the world literally um, and i'm i'm uh, 19 years old and my photographs are, pe are appearing all over the world um, and uh, this is an example of of one of the underground newspapers uh, this was the Daily Planet, which was a newspaper that was underground newspaper published in uh, Miami. Um, I also then found that being an activist and being political and being a photographer, you are noticed. And this is actually one of the pages from my FBI file um, that, I, that I had, which I include 
some of those in my book, uh, What's Going On. Um, and then I continued photographing. Um, and so I think part of my journey as photographer has been to just kind of be curious and um, uh, try, to, try to think of, you know, what are the things around me that need to be seen and capture and why, why are these things happening? And this is a, a Nixon rally. Um, and this is one of the photographs from the moratorium march. Um, Bobby Seale uh, at a Black Panther rally. Um, in 72, I traveled uh, with President Nixon. I was credentialed to travel with President Nixon on a motorcade through Ohio. It was the only campaign swing he made during that election. He went through about eight or nine different cities. Um, and this was a, a, one of the photo opportunities that kind of was set up uh, so the president would stop and, and talk to people. Uh, this is John Lennon and Yoko Ono at a political protest in Ann Arbor, Michigan. This is actually me when I had hair um, in 1972 at the Republican convention in Miami uh, with uh, two, two Nikon Fs and a Leica M4. And if you look at the right, you'll see that little L Lunar Gossen Pro hanging down, which I used to make, a, make exposures. Um, and so I photographed the convention. Um, the access then was very different than the access now. This is Nixon at one of the inaugural balls that I attended and photographed at. And I continued photographing um, many different parts of, of what I saw was America. Uh, this is DeWitt Clinton in the Bronx High School um, that I, I spent uh, many weeks photographing in this high school. Um, Nixon's reelected. The war starts to end. The POWs um, are going to be brought home. And this is waiting for the POWs to return at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. I came west. And this is go going west from Ohio. I continued photographing. I landed in Berkeley. This is in uh, West Oakland. And then Nixon, you know, Watergate happens. Nixon resigns. and. Um, this is his resignation speech. Um, and this, this led me to do this book, What's Going On? Uh, and it's really interesting uh, because before What's Going On, I had many other books that I had done and had been published by Aperture and uh, UC Press and Hey Day and you know, many different publishers. Um, and I had always wanted to do this book. And um, I kept reaching out to publishers and they kept saying to me, we hate Nixon. We hate this period. People won't buy this book. They're not interested. We've seen these pictures before. And so, um, you know, I, 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 I shopped this book around for quite some time. And I finally got tired of shopping it around. And I decided I would do a Kickstarter and do it myself. And I think that's one of the great things of this book fair and also zines that people have important projects that maybe they can't find a publisher and they create zines to share their work, um, which is you know so, so important in communicating within the photography world. Um, I, I, tried, I wanted to raise $35,000 to publish this book. I ended up raising $45,000 um, and put together the book, hired the designer. Uh, this is me on press in Italy where the book was published. And then, of course, one of the big problems of doing a self-published book is, yes, you end up with boxes and boxes of books in your house that you have to ship out. Um, and so this is uh, um, about 400 of the books, 450 of the books, which is what was originally purchased uh, for the Kickstarter, um, in addition of about 1,100 books uh, were printed, and there's about 70 copies left of the book. So um, this is my little ad. Uh, if you if you love books and you love this era, you, era, you might want to get a copy of this book, uh, uh, first edition copy of this book before it's uh, before it's gone. Um, and the last picture in the book, of course, is this picture of uh, Nixon resigns, which was made the next day in West Oakland. Uh, which was a place I was beginning to photograph uh, in, in 1974. Um, after I 
after I did this project, I moved to California. I worked in West Oakland, but I became very, very interested in um, agricultural workers. Um, and I began to um, think about the work that had been done. I actually did a, uh, my first book was actually a book I did with two other photographers with a introduction by Paul Taylor, who's Dorothea Lang's husband. And Paul at that time was still alive and he was a professor, he had retired, but he had an office at UC Berkeley. Um, and we were able to get Paul to write an introduction to our, our book, which was the last piece that Paul wrote before his death. Um, but I had also, I had continued photographing agricultural workers and I received the National Endowment for the Arts Photographers Fellowship to continue. Um, and I traveled all over the United States. I moved from shooting 35 millimeter uh, pictures to uh, shooting with a uh, medium format uh, camera um, with a Hasselblad. And this was partly brought about because I hung out with a group of young photographers they all were in their 20s at Berkeley at the ASUC studio, and they included photographers like Richard Mizrock and Roger Minnick and Steve Fitch and, and many others. It was kind of a, uh, a gathering place for uh, photographers in the East Bay. We all were young, you know, 22, 23, 24 years old. Um, and they were all using Hasselblads. And uh, I just love this, the prints they were making and the negative and the camera. And so, uh, this was the first project uh, I really began to go out into the field in and photograph. I traveled all over the United States. Uh, this is in Texas, Rio Grande Valley, young girl working in the onion fields, um, another young girl, agricultural worker, um, uh, followed migrant workers. Um, this is in the Salt River Valley in Arizona, seven o'clock in the morning as the parents are out picking green onions. And the more, the more, I, um, the more I traveled, um, the more I began to see undocumented workers. Um, and it, and uh, for example, this worker, uh, this is in uh, the Salt River Valley in Arizona. Um, and these workers, he's not homeless. He's actually sleeping in the orchard because these workers are afraid to live in town because they'll be picked up and sent back. And so the fear of being um, apprehended and returned to Mexico was so deep at that time that they chose to live in the fields. Um, and so as I traveled and the more I traveled, I began to see more and more undocumented workers. Um, and it was really kind of um, shocking uh, a powerful experience, uh, partly because I, I remember um, going up to the Yakima Valley, for example, or Hood River, Oregon, Yakima Valley in Washington and Hood River in, in Oregon. And, you know, I'd get on an airplane and I have to rent a car and it would take me an hour and a half to get to the fields uh, or the orchards. And, you know, here were these people who had come from Oaxaca or Michoacan um, or, or you know, other states in, in Mexico. Um, and, they were, and they were working in the fields um, and they were following the crops. Um, and I began to realize as I was finishing this project, uh, which I hope was gonna be a book. And it, as you saw, it ended up being this, uh, my first book of, of my own photographs with a, uh, a forward by Cesar Chavez. Um, I realized I should go down to the border and I should um, make a few pictures of people coming through as part of the story that I was trying to put together about agriculture workers uh, throughout the United States. Um, and so um, I decided to, to do that. And, and I think one of the funny star, uh, side stories of, of this project was I was very good friends with Bill Owens uh, at that time, oh, I'm still good friends with Bill Owens, but I remember Bill and I talking about this work and Bill said to me, you know, don't, don't photograph agricultural workers. Dorothea Lang did it. No one can make better pictures than Dorothea Lang. And I kind of, you know, that has always stuck in my mind because I feel that every, every generation of photographers, um, every new generation of photographers needs to re-examine these stories that continue. And the story, particularly the story of agricultural workers hasn't uh, ended uh, right now, um, you know, with the pandemic, 
Uh, these workers, these quote, essential, essential workers are out in the fields unprotected working in the fields. And I know there are a number of young photographers who have gone out and documented this. So these are stories that keep happening. So I, I called the INS, uh, the Immigration Service, um, as I was driving down to the border and uh, said, I'm doing this book project and I'd like to get permission to, to um, photograph. And they said, fine. Um, and it was partly because um, I think I, my, my perception is the INS at that time didn't, felt, didn't feel seen. And I think they felt if people photographed the conditions in the border, that they would get more money to be able to uh, fortify the border and to apprehend more people. Um, and so uh, this, this is actually me um, photographing one evening. And you can see I'm using the Hasselblad and a Vivitar 285. Um, to to make the photographs at night because there's there's absolutely complete blackness and um, one of the one of the great challenges as a photographer of this project was you actually could not see through the viewfinder to focus it was too dark and we did not have autofocus in those days um, or TTL uh, through the through the um, lens light metering um, and so I would pre-focus before I went out at night. Um, and I traveled, uh, in this first trip, I traveled from about four in the afternoon until seven in the morning. And I went through two different shifts. So as a shift changed about midnight or one o'clock, I just went with the next shift and continued photographing, uh, which most photographers didn't do because the technology at that time um, was, was very difficult shooting at night. Um, and so most photographers who were photographing the story of the border, and there were many, there were many newspapers covering the story, and 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 some other independent photographers. Um, they mainly photographed at dusk, um, and at dusk you didn't really find the numbers of people coming across that you found at, at night because of the risk. And so this is one of the earliest pictures um, that I made um, on on this trip. Um, this first trip um, was, um, it's hard to explain, um, you know, observing people who are desperate to find a better life, um, who, you know, have risked and have, who have left their families behind um, and, are, and are wanting to come here simply to work. Um, it was relevatory to me, um, partly because we're all immigrants. We all, you know, the only people who, are, who belong here are native people. The rest of us are immigrants. We may have forgotten we're immigrants, but we're all immigrants. We came from somewhere else. And I, I thought of my own family and I, and I thought about how um, we, had, we had absolutely no record of our family coming. I mean, visual record. We have no visual, we have no photographs of the villages we came from. We can barely remember the countries we came from. You know, we, we, the villages forget, we don't, we don't know the names. We, we don't have the dates when we came. We know we, we know we came in steerage. We have no pictures of steerage. You know, I always think of the famous uh, Stieglitz photograph of the steerage, but most often people talk about it as being this great modern photograph. They never talk about the people in steerage and what they left behind and the pogroms and the, and the starvation. Um, and so encountering this moment, um, I thought to myself, I, I, have, this, I have this responsibility. I have, I have access to this, to this moment to be able to make these photographs. And in 50 years and 100 years, and as long as people are, people can see the photographs, um, people will be asking each other, how did, how did, I heard our grandfather came through the fence. What was that experience like? Um, and so I felt because I had this access, this deep responsibility to um, continue the story. And so um, as, I, as I was uh, publishing or as my book on farm workers was being published, which includes this photograph and includes actually two of the, the first photographs I made at night, 
um, I decided I needed to continue this project. Um, and that would end up being a book called To the Promised Land that was published by Aperture in, in uh, 1988. So from 1983 to 1987, um, I, I photographed along the border um, and I began to show the night pictures to various different friends and curators. Um, and they, they, were, they, they really liked the pictures a lot, particularly the night pictures. But I didn't feel that, they really, that people really got the story at that time that I was trying to tell, which was the story of people leaving their country and, and trying to come to America and, and what they found. And so while I continued to photograph at night along the border, um, I went into Mexico. I made two trips. The first trip was to Michoacan um, for a month. And the second trip was to Oaxaca for a month with the idea of photographing the communities um, in which people were coming from Mexico into the US. And this is, uh, this is a Mixteco community. Uh, it took us five hours on dirt roads to get to this community in Mexico. They speak no Spanish, they speak Mixtec. And we drive into this town and here are these women and this woman has a sweatshirt with a Dodgers patch on it. And I'm like, what the heck? And they say, well, yes, her, her son works in Los Angeles. He's undocumented and he went and he sends money back to the family. And you begin to realize that um, while at the time uh, the newspapers in America were describing, this was in the eighties, um, there were headlines, the Brown invasion, um, you know, the crisis at the border and the Brown invasion um, that really part of the invasion was the opposite that the, the, this very rich Mexican culture was being changed by men going to the North and being influenced by what they observed and coming back and kind of sharing that Northern culture, which isn't always so good uh, with communities. Um, and so this is a wedding in the, the actual town I lived in for a month. Well, I, I traveled around a lot, but this was my base. Um, and I stayed with uh, one of my colleagues who, who, lit, who was born in this village, was my guide, feet of the Campesino. Um, this is going through the fence from Mexico into the US. And at that time, this was the fence. I mean, it was, it was a chain link fence like you might find around a schoolyard. That, that was the border fence uh, in 1983. Um, and this was um, what was called by the Mexicans, Canyon Zapata, by the Americans, the soccer field. And this was in San Isidro, between Tijuana and San Isidro. And this was a place where at night, um, people would gather. Uh, this, was this was around dusk. And as it got darker and darker, people would begin to try to filter through the fence uh, coming into the north. Um, and this is um, a couple of, of three people apprehended in the trunk of a car. So that book came out. I've gone on to do many, many other books, many other projects, you know, a book on death row, a book on rural Mississippi, a book on the Central Valley. Um, but when Trump began to campaign, and particularly when he made this statement, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists and some I assume are good people. He, he kept you know, uh, making, making these statements about these, these immigrants. And as we know, he had some of these immigrants working in his clubs, you know, as housemaids and gardeners illegally. Um, and we all know, I mean, we just look around us, you know, the, the people who are undocumented, who have come here, who are working, who are doing all these things that are, that are part of, um, you know, our, our lives and our lifestyles um, and, our, and in our communities who are often unseen. Um, and so while I had moved on, this, this statement by Donald Trump made me realize that, you know, and build the wall and all the rhetoric that followed that uh, this, the story of immigration, particularly during these next four years was gonna be a really big story. And I thought to myself, 
you know, I should, I should really go back and look at that work. Um, because any body of work a photographer does, who's a documentary photographer, is usually very in depth and books can only have so many pictures and you make choices. And you know, um, when you look back and, and as I said, To the Promised Land came out in 1988 um, and those, those negatives and contact sheets you know, went into a file. I mean, it was you know, over 30 years ago and the aesthetics of photography changes, the, your own aesthetic, your own eye changes. Um, and, I, and I decided I'm, I'm gonna go back and, um, and look, at those, look at those photographs. So I went back, I pulled out all the contact sheets uh, that I had, that I had made and began to, began to look at them. Um, and I was kind of um, shocked. I was kind of shocked that there were uh, so many images that um, I'd never printed, that I just kind of had passed over. And partly because this book I had done with Aperture had three parts and one part was Mexico and the middle part was the border. And the last part was the North where people ended up. And so the number of night pictures in that book were, were I wanna say they were maybe seven, uh, seven or eight um, night pictures. Um, and I, I started printing and you can see my dark room, you know, is very, uh, I'm still printing uh, with a Omega D2V and, um, I was making, uh, I was editing and making 16 by 20 prints. Um, and I slowly over about a year and a half with other, I mean, you know, I'm teaching, I'm working on other things. Um, I slowly began to, um, to, to print. Um, and I had a whole body of work that ended up being about 87 pictures. Um, and uh, two things happened. Um, we had uh, a wonderful new curator. We, ha we had had uh, Sandra Phillips, you know, one of the great curators in, in uh, modern photography, who was the curator at SF MoMA, uh, retire. Um, and we had Clement Chereau come in and replace her. Um, and I, I reached out to Clement um, and he came over to my house to look at my work. And um, at that point, I, I showed him numerous projects that I was working on. Um, and I showed him this project and he said, wow, this, this project is great. I, I would like to include this project in the museum. Uh, and he ended up purchasing all 87 photographs, 16 by 20 photographs to add to the museum collection uh, at, at the SF MoMA, um, which was very exciting. Um, particularly that they're, they're there. Um, and long after I leave the planet, um, we, we hope the MoMA will, will be there. And it's, it's there for the future to see, for people to see and, and uh, be available. And at the same time, I started to think about doing a book with these pictures. And my first instinct was to reach out to Paul Sheik at TBW Books. And TBW is based in Oakland. Um, they're, they're, uh, Paul is, Paul is uh, um, a great editor and thinker about photography. And he's done just beautiful, uh, powerful books, all different types of books. And I reached out to Paul and I sent him a PDF of all 87 pictures. And he immediately me emailed me back and said, wow, let's meet. I wanna talk to you about doing a book. And so um, Paul, Paul came over with, with Lester Russo, who at that point was, was uh, working with Paul. Um, and we went through the pictures and Paul said, yes, we're, we're, gonna, do, we're gonna do a book. And so uh, we were able to um, reach out to um, the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation. Uh, and Jonathan Logan uh, was able to help support the book uh, that Paul wanted to do. Um, and we also began to think about the text. Um, and I felt the text was really important, particularly because I'm a white photographer photographing a world that is not my own world that I am, that I am observing. Um, and so often um, white photographers, you know, are observant of many other cultures and we bring our own uh, cultural experience. Um, and so um, I had seen this 
very powerful um, text uh, by Jose Angel Navas uh, in a book that he wrote called uh, Illegal, My Life Under the Shadows. And the first, I wanna say six pages of that book was the most powerful and most beautiful um, writing I'd ever, I've, I had ever read um, about the firsthand experience of someone coming through the fence. Um, and Jose, his, his writing was just poetry uh, mixed with incredible, incredible sadness. Um, and so I said to Paul, you know, I, I, I would love to excerpt this part of the book because it just really um, adds to, this, to the story. And, and Paul said, yeah, this is, this is great. Um, and we reached out to Jose and we got permission from his publisher and we were able to use Jose's text, which is published in the book, both in English and, and in Spanish. And one of the things, I don't know, um, that TBW wrote about the book, which I thought was really interesting. And in presenting this work as a book, we have attempted to treat the work with as much seriousness and sensitivity as possible with the unwavering belief that the images and texts in the book are worthy of being seen and read and of vital importance to the discourse our country currently finds itself engaged in regarding the treatment of migrant peoples. Frequently in art and in photography in particular, work that is of great value often makes us uncomfortable. And in creating this book, we have worked very closely with Ken and Jose to present images and texts that are both difficult and beautiful in service to a greater dialogue and to provide the context necessary for that dialogue to continue. We hope that you and others will find this to be the case when you spend time with the full book. And so um, I work with Paul and Lester. Um, we, you know, um, you can see on the right, the, the proof of the printing and we were very diligent about um, being, being very careful how um, the, the images were printed in the book um, and um, I, I want to say um, this is my 11th book, and this is probably one of the um, most exciting um, um, collaborations that I've had with a publisher. Um, just really, um, you know, conversations and discussions and give and take. And, um, you know, I think Paul and Lester were both very worried because I had done so many books that I was gonna be one of these very stubborn photographers, which was gonna be my way or the highway. Uh, but um, I, I was really, um, I fell in love with them and their process. And they are, they are just, um, Paul in particular is really just, you know, brilliant about his way of, of seeing work. Um, and we created this book, uh, Midnight La Frontera. And, um, this is the cover of the book. Um, and um, they, were, they were very, very um, not only respectful to the photographs, but also they were respectful of the photographs within an object, which I think is uh, one, of the, one of the most exciting things about uh, doing a book. Um, and so the first, the first part of the book is printed on this very beautiful, thick black paper. And we open the book with the photographs of people who are hiding from the border patrol. Um, and as I described, um, I, I would go out with an agent. It's very different now. If you um, go out along the border, if you get permission to travel with the border patrol, you're gonna go with a PIO, a public information officer. And they're like, you know, the press people working for the border patrol and they are gonna steer you and let you see what they want you to see. Um, and so um, I, guess the, I guess I would describe this experience as kind of what photographers, the experience photographers had during the Vietnam War is that they, they, could, they could go and photograph anything and the military had no sense that these photographs might um, change people's opinion about the war. And I think at this time that I was photographing in the 80s, the Border Patrol, you know, they, they just had no understanding of the power of the photograph. Um, and so I would, I would go out, like I said, four in the afternoon until seven in the morning. And I would be right next to the Border Patrol agent. I'd sit in the front 
in the Ram Charger, and he would, he would, you know, um, he'd get calls that a sensor went off, or he'd he'd say, "Let's hide in the bushes and wait till people come down," and then when I jump up, you can take a picture. Um, and I went to places um, that they didn't allow other photographers to go to. I, they just felt comfortable with me, and I was very careful in in terms of my conversations with them, particularly when those conversations might turn political. I would I just would kind of sit there and smile. Um, and so um, they, they allowed me to see a lot. Um, and this is Jose, um, and this is one of his wonderful quotes. The stretch between Tijuana and San Diego is long, very long, and it is as treacherous as it is beautiful. It is unlikely that anybody who has ever crossed, it will easily forget it. Its desert-like landscape is bound to carve itself equally onto body and soul. Um, and so the text, um, as I said, the Jaguar's path is um, beautifully presented in the book. The left is English, the right is the Spanish translation. Um, and um, it just really tells the story from Jose's heart. And the interesting about, thing about Jose um, is uh, Jose uh, came from Guadalajara. Um, he, he didn't graduate uh, from high school. Um, he came here to look for work. Um, and he just, this year, I believe it was this year, got his PhD um, in Chicago, uh, the University of Chicago. Um, um, and he's still undocumented, which is kind of crazy. Um, and, and, and he's a perfect example of, um, the, the push against the rhetoric that Trump and the Republicans have thrown out about people who are und undocumented and wh who they become and what they do and their importance, the importance of immigrants in this nation of ours. And we are, as I said at the beginning, we are all immigrant, immigrants at some point. And our, and our uh, predecessors, our families, our, our, our grandparents, our great grandparents, pushed against the same sort of political rhetoric, um, whether they be um, Irish or from Jewish from Eastern Europe or from other Latin American countries, um, you know, the same, the same sort of hatred um, that was thrown against them is something that's part of our culture right now. Um, one of the last minute um, uh, changes, and one of, the, one of the things that was really interested in doing this book or interesting in doing this book was how do we sequence them? And while there were 87 pictures in the whole project, we, we, only, we, only, we didn't use all 87 pictures. Um, so we did, we did a bunch of editing. I think it was a really good edit. Um, and uh, literally we went from the blackness of the night photographs to this double page spread, which we decided two days before we had to send the files to the printer. Um, let's blow this picture up across two pages. Um, and we just, you know, we just all sat there and looked at it and thought, this is just a really wonderful visual transition from the blackness to then the photographs that are printed then on the white the white paper. And this is then um, the opening of the sequence that, that we created. Um, and the beginning of the book, we chose to have single images on the right page. And this is a, this is a young man hiding in the trucking yard among the wheels of the truck. And of course, one of the great sadness were seeing all these young children um, with their parents um, trying to come here for a better life.
One of the other things we did, and it and it's really you know interesting that as Paul said, we were trying to make a powerful book that told this story that revealed, I mean, really revealed the the moments that where where people's hopes were dashed. Um, but yet we wanted to present the work in a in an object that honored honored their struggle. Um, and so one of the things we did, uh, which was really, really interesting, was you can see the thread. Normally books have white thread and we decided let's use black thread and the black thread is kind of like the border. Um, and so I thought that was, that was really interesting. And, and, and I think an example of how um, Paul and Lester really not only thought about the photographs, but really thought about framing of the object um, with a lot of deep thought and a lot of um, heartfelt um, um, sincerity. And then I'm not gonna show you all the pictures, but then we move from the individual photographs of people um, who are hiding, who have been, who have been caught, um, to kind of the introduction of the border agents. And we all of a sudden go from single page to a mix of double page photographs and then, and then to single, single pictures. Um, and this is, this is the last, uh, last photograph uh, of, of the book. And then we have, again, we go back to the black paper of the book. Um, and then um, a text that I wrote, um, and I'll, I'll quickly read it. Um, it's called Night After Night. The summer air was stifling as I sat in the pas passenger side of the Border Patrol Rams Charger. It was the early morning and the landscape was barely visible in the deep darkness of Otay Mesa. As the radio crackled in the background with calls like 1016, pick up aliens in custody, the agent responded to the call 1060, a sensor hit, signaling there might be a group of illegal aliens, they're, they're what, how they describe them, uh, moving across uh, the landscape. We drove quickly, feeling every rut and hole in the road and kicking up a storm of dust behind us. The agent at the wheel, his eyes peering into the darkness, checks, checked out the Razorback E2 Dillon Canyon and the China in Tube, just some of the locations where he suspected illegal border crosses would be found hiding or weaving across the barren terrain along the US-Mexican border. Between 1983 and 1987, I took my Hasselblad camera with a flash and rode along with the US Border Patrol agents as they combed the line, capturing undocumented Im immigrants. Night after night, from four in the afternoon until seven in the morning, I photographed the drama of the border as people desperately tried to cross into the United States. They were looking for a safe harbor where they could be treated with civility and create a new life in the land of the free. The photographs captured extreme vulnerability fear and desperation as hope gave way to despair. My photographs bore witness to the inhumane, inhumane treatment here. It is so unsettling to see the same emotional pain now as a new generation of photographers responds to the even harsher practices of the 21st century at the United States border. We as a country have not yet successfully faced our lack of humanity towards immigrants. And then uh, this, is, this is the back of uh, the cover of the book. Um, so these are just some other individual photographs. Um, and the thing that I found really interesting in um, editing the pictures were, these were probably pictures in 1983. Well, I shouldn't say they were, I, I thought they were, they were. These were pictures I just passed by and looking at the contact sheets. And then all of a sudden in re-examining, um, the work realized that there were these moments that were just um, an incredible, powerful experience that needed to be seen by others of what I witnessed.
This was actually the photograph uh, or the moment that I made this photograph when um, I asked the border patrol agent, um, you know, where these people were from. And um, this, was, this was after um, the father was begging the border patrol agent to let him go, saying that where he was coming from, which was from Mishwakan, um, that there was, at, there was no work. And he was trying to get to Los Angeles with his family where he had a job. And he just wanted to have a better life for his family. And, um, you know, the border patrol agent was just like, no, you know, get in the back of the truck. Um, and this was, this was the era of what they call catch and release, which basically was um, people were, were apprehended. They filled out a form. They were held sometimes for an hour, sometimes for three hours. They were put on a bus. They were driven down to the border fence and they were released back into Mexico, into Tijuana. Um, and um, many times they, they would attempt to come through two or three times. Um, you know, that, that was, you know, the, the conditions in Mexico at that time were, were so desperate. Um, the peso was devalued and there was a lot of hunger and poverty. Um, and, and this was the hope um, that people had of, of coming to this country. So again, these are all pictures that are then uh, part of the, the book. So um, I'm, I'm happy to be part of uh, the, the book and zine fair. And uh, both of my books, What's Going On and Midnight La Frontera are available uh, on, on the website, which uh, as Dave described, you can go to the website now and uh, check out the books. You don't have to wait to the big uh, event, the day of the event, uh, since we're all virtual now. And I hope that, uh, some of you will be moved by these books and uh, think about uh, buying them. Um, and I'm happy to uh, answer questions that any of you might have. Ken, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing this work. And yes, please visit our website, sfcamerawork.org, and you'll see the Book and Zine Fair, where you'll find links that take you to Ken's books and books from 40 other artists that we're excited to be working with. And if you have questions for Ken, please uh, put them in the chat. If you'd like to unmute and ask them, let us know um, through the chat and we're, we're happy to give you the microphone. There was a question that scrolled by earlier, Ken, I think it was yeah. from Susan, about how you communicate, how you communicate your intentions. And, and she asked it earlier in your presentation and it stuck with me as I was listening to you speak after she asked it, because when you were a journalist and in the press, you were of the press when you were taking these photographs of immigrants crossing the border, you're with the, the INS, if I'm understanding, you're, you're with yes. the crew that's going in. And so, yes. and so how, did you, how did you navigate that, communicating who you were as a photographer, if possible, issues of consent, who you're with and how you're getting access? The images are incredibly moving. You're, you're as you said, as you concluded, you're it's clear why it's important to capture those images and share them with us. How did you navigate being there and, and actually capturing those images of these people who are, as you say, struggling and, and giving everything they can to, to try to achieve this dream and not making it, which is when you get the opportunity to take those photographs? Well, you know, first of all, yes, I'm, I'm right with, I'm doing a ride along which, you know, you can do a ride along. I mean, I've done ride alongs with the LAPD and you're with them. Um, and, and, you know, people were, um, I would say people were kind of unconcerned with me taking pictures. No one ever asked who is that or what you're doing. They were more concerned with what was gonna happen to them. Um, and so there was, 
there was no consent. I mean, I didn't, I did not ask him if I could take a picture. I mean, I just took a picture. I was there. Um, um, you know, my, my, um, feeling and experience and reason for doing that was because this, I felt this was an important historical moment to capture. And I didn't know if anyone else would be able to do it in the future. I mean, at the moment at this time or in the future. Um, and, um, really for people to understand, um, the fear and, um, horror of, you know, one being like, an animal, and it's really it's really interesting because I'm doing a, a film um, with a colleague of mine at the journalism school, uh, Andres Sedel. He and I are working on a film based on these photographs. Um, and one of the things um, that uh, uh, we just I would show the film tonight. It's it's like we have a, a show reel. It's about 12 minutes, but we haven't gotten permission from some of the the other footage we've used, um, but. Uh, one of the first interviews we did was one of the Border Patrol agents that I traveled with um, in 1983. We, we discovered, I discovered he was living up in Montana, Montana. He was retired and we, I called him and he was so happy to hear from me and said, I'd love to talk to you. We went up to Montana to his house to film him. And, you know, um, it, was, it was incredible um, him describing his own experience of apprehending people. And in fact, um, he said it was like hunting. I mean, this is exactly what he says. It was like hunting, except you don't pull the trigger. Um, and so this was kind of the attitude of the Border Patrol. Um, and, you know, um, wet, they were called wetbacks. And I mean, it had, you know, or tonks. Why were they called tonks? They were called tonks because that's the sound the flashlight makes when you hit them on the head. Um, so this was what was surrounding me as I was photographing. Um, and so um, I just was really conscious of my role as a photographer of observing these moments and trying to, to capture it and, and not censoring it. And, um, you know, we would love, I mean, part of our journey of doing this film is uh, we would love to find some of these people in the pictures, some of the undocumented people in the pictures and find out where are they and what was their experience like and talk wow. to them about it which is like looking for a needle in a haystack. So it was, it was, I don't know if that answers the question. It was very, it was, it was tough. Yeah. It was really, really tough. Well, I, I think it, you want to cry. I mean, that couple who were from Mishwakan who just begged to be let go. I mean, I really wanted to cry. It, um, it, it looks like it. I think you come personally just as looking through it. It feels like it comes through the work that you're documenting something important and, and, and you know you're documenting something heartbreaking. I want to turn to a couple other questions that are coming in the chat, but I had I had one more question for you about, you know, because you were embedded and that's that's how you were able to, to get these images. It was really interesting that you mentioned, you know, perhaps part of the reason you got permission is because it might make people sympathetic to the cause of, of enforcement. Do you think the attitudes, I know you get asked this about your political work explicitly with the comparisons to Trump and Nixon and others, they're there. I'm wondering if you can reflect a little bit on the attitude that Americans have that perhaps the Immigration and National uh, Nationalization Service has towards the immigrants they're working with. Is the is the the rancor that I think we've seen, certainly in the current administration, um, did it feel the same way then or has it shifted? You mentioned when we were chatting before um, how you know, not too long after these images, Reagan signed an amnesty agreement. Was it different then, or is it all part of a problem we've been dealing with from the beginning? I, I think it's all, I mean, no one, no one can figure it out. And um, there's just this very um, sad, harsh relationship uh, between undocumented people and where they're coming from and, and uh, you know, um, what they, I mean, half the country feels like they're stealing jobs, but these are jobs that they don't want to do, you know, one, um, and they don't pay taxes. And I mean, the list, the list just goes on. Um, and it is, I think it, it's just an ongoing problem that um, I, I, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in the Biden administration, if they're going to deal with this issue or not. 
Uh, and I think it just every, you know, every administration just doesn't want to deal with it or think about it. Right. Uh, hopefully we at least have a better decision maker in place now than we did. Yes. Before. And no cages and children. Yeah, right. I, mean, I think that's why, I mean, I think that's the horror. Image, that was a horror. It's Well, I think your images are heartbreaking. The images we're seeing now are just unfathomable in their, in their cruelty. And, it, and it, you know, it feels like we've been on this, this path for a while. And it's interesting, we, we, as part of our film, we actually went down to the border to film again, partly to uh, literally take some of my photographs and embed them in the spaces where I had photographed. And we went and I returned to places that I photographed and they didn't, you know, I said to them, let's go to Dillon's, Dillon's Canyon and they're, and the, or the Razorback and they're like, where's that? And they actually had to get an old time border patrol agent to come with us because he knew where, where these places that had been called, you know, had been nicknamed back back then, and as we were as we were filming, we were with, with a PIO. Uh, one night, um, we you know we said we wanted to go from five o'clock to three in the morning, and they said fine. Um, the second night we went out, uh, as we were filming around nine o'clock, uh, a call came over the radio that it was a bunch of people were at the fence. They had sat down, which was which is what was happening at that time. You know, people are asking for amnesty, so they're not running like the era in which I photographed, trying to, you know, go north. They're just coming across, the, going through the fence and sitting down and saying, we want amnesty. And there was a group of people that did that. And we rushed down there and we started filming. And literally, I'd say after three minutes of filming, the agent said, that's enough. Stop filming. You have to get back into the truck. You can't see this. People are really up. The, the agents that are doing this are really upset that you're here. Mm. And, you know, we kind of had to stop. Um, but it was, it was fascinating. In fact, the cinematographer we were working with, as they're, they're telling us this, took out the, the card, you know, the digital card and hit it and put another one in in case they decided they wanted to confiscate the footage that we made. So you know, it was a, just a different time. Hmm. I think you've you've answered this mostly. I'm going to try to pivot into a, a slightly different question, but I want to acknowledge it uh, from our friend Dane Pollock. I, I, I asked a somewhat similar question, but he asked it better. What was it like making these images and portraits along slide, alongside, to put it frankly, the American captors? Was there a tension that you had to navigate and overcome while making this work simultaneous to the moment these migrants meant the end of their June journey, right? They were sent back, they had to turn around. Your empathy with the migrant stories contrasts with the intentions and, and by proxy the viewpoints of those border patrol, like were you at odds with them even as you had sympathy uh, for the people you were, you were documenting? Did they, how did they view you? And if that makes sense. Um, I think they liked me. I mean, I was, right? I was, I was, I was very careful um, in my conversations with them. So when they, when they, when they were racist, you know, mm -hmm. in their attitudes, I would never push back. I wouldn't agree with them. I just would try to shift the conversation. Um, and, um, you know, uh, you try to figure out how to, um, create an environment, particularly when you're wor working with agents like that who are, who are completely giving you the access, right? I mean, they're deciding where you're gonna go and what you're gonna see, because you're in their vehicle. Um, you know, I, I just try to be a nice guy and I'm just along taking the pictures and they really never asked um, what I was thinking. I just was a photographer. Right. And right. I think part of it actually, Dave, was that they were lonely they're out there by themselves on a long night shift. And I'm like a distraction. I'm like this person in the vehicle with them who can talk to them and they can show me, you know, they can show me what they're doing. And I think they saw it from a very different perspective. I thought, I think they thought that I was kind of maybe honoring what they were doing. I'm sure they, yeah. And I think you must've had an access, you know, now that, that, we are able to speak more frankly of this. Um, when I have had a camera and tried to go to public events, we're not just photographers, we are white men with photographers, you know, surrounded by that kind of enforcement agency and so on. That, that yeah, that, that privilege must be, that, that 
tension must be difficult to navigate in the moment because you're, you know what it is you're documenting. I, I want to switch to a couple. I, I really appreciate it. It's the book and zine fair. Thank you for sharing a lot about the book and the production of the book itself. Um, there was a question about uh, why, you know, like how did you capture that, that two page spread? Uh, I wonder if you can speak to as well. Um, but oh, go ahead. why did you do that one? I, that, that was TBW. They, they have some people who just take the book and, and, and you know, reproduce it so it looks like a book, which is kind of cool. But the, I'm saying specifically the two page spread with the overhead shot. The question was, it looked like it was shot perhaps with a drone um, or with a technique that might not have been readily available when you were making that work. I don't know which picture you're talking about. I'm sorry. You were, it's the, um, well, and I can use this to, to move towards the production of the book. Yeah. You said that in your work with um, TBW, you made the last minute decision right before the printers. Oh, that picture. You, I, yes. Yeah, the uh, overhead shot. That and was from a helicopter. I was so it helicopter. was. You did have, so not only just riding around, you were actually, yeah. as part of this work, in helicopters. And, yeah, and, I went up in the Border Patrol helicopter. Wow. They want to show it to me. Wow. Yeah, and you kind of, you know, when you're when you're there, you can kind of say, I mean, one of the other things that I did that um, wasn't in this book, and there's a couple of images in the To the Promised Land book, was um, one of the things they said was, you can photograph anywhere we are. So the border, from the border fence, I don't remember if it's 20 or 30 miles from the border fence, there's no, they can go into anyone's backyard. You don't need a search warrant if you're a border patrol agent. So they said, anywhere we go, you can, you can make photographs. You don't need permission because you're with us. Right. You're with but, the, yeah, with but when you're in the, when you're in the, in the cells that we have, where we're keeping people locked up before we move them to Mexico, you cannot, you cannot photograph people there. And I said, okay. And you know, when we did a shift change or when I showed up in the afternoon to the border patrol station, um, or the agent would go in to drop people off or whatever it was, they put him in a holding tank and I never took pictures. But over the years, as I did this, I began to realize, wait, there's all these other photographers. I've seen them, they're making, you know, not a lot, but I've seen some pictures where photographers are doing this and they're not supposed to. And I was kind of like, screw it. I'm going to, I'm going to do it. So one, one evening, you know, at midnight when it was a shift change and I was waiting to go out with the next agent, I just wandered into this, the holding area where the cells were. And I walked into the cells and I made photographs and uh, them making mug shots. And I did all this stuff. And I would say after about 45 or 50 minutes, an agent came up to me and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm taking pictures. He says, you can't take pictures. I'm like, oh, okay, sorry. And that was, and that was the end of it. And, but I had those pictures. So again, those pictures become an important record. It's like, you know, um, pictures that we see now that are made of kids in these, in these holding cells, these, you know, immigration concentration camps. Um, you know, those, I mean, you can, you, I mean, this is the power of photography. You can talk about these moments, but unless you see these moments, people don't believe it. Hmm. They just don't. And, Really, that's been my whole experience as a photographer. I'm photographing things that I think people need to see that either they don't want to see, they don't believe is really happening. Um, and photography, I think, um, still has that, that power. If it crystallizes what I think would otherwise be abstract for us. You help us to see that. I want to acknowledge a, a comment that Liz Harvey made in the in the chat, if uh, yeah. in part so that it, it would come into the video. Um, it was when you were describing the the systemic racism that you were navigating in order to make this this work and and the types of comments that you heard. And Liz wrote, "Undocumented folks, of course, do pay taxes, which yes, uh, yeah. you, you may have meant. You know, it's a misconception. Yeah. Uh, 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 my 20s were spent with a partner who was undocumented, and he and his family all paid into the system." but weren't able to draw from social services. It was an education. Yeah. And, and I think that really strikes me in light of the, the image you shared early in the presentation of the men who were not homeless, but were sleeping on cardboard in the fields because they couldn't go into town. They were afraid to go into town. They were working, 
they were generating, you know, income and 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 yet not allowed to participate or or let alone so social services even go into the city. Um, it's humbling. I, I want to ask you a little bit um, again in the spirit of the book and zine fair. You shared two books with us today, and you described actually two very very different processes. One was a self published book where you did your own curation, put it together, figured out. A self-published book, you know, and you've worked with lots of publishers, you've chose to make a self-published book. And then this book with TBW, where you are working with, with um, artists of the photo book who have a very clear image and I imagine a, a clear vision and are doing a lot of the curating uh, on their own. As an artist approaching a book, as a, as a photographer and journalist approaching to the book, how was that different? What, what can you speak to the difference in, in in the way these books came to be and the process that allowed them to to uh, the, the decision making process that led to them? Yeah, the self the self published book was kind of um, brought out of desperation that I felt that this work was really important. The early work, you know, what's going on was really important, and I just couldn't find a publisher, and I didn't want to spend the rest of my life hunting someone down to do that. And so, um, you know, Kickstarter is like the new philanthropy. And, uh, you know, it's fabulous to be able to gather a community of people who are interested in your ideas and your work and ask them to support you rather than finding a foundation or a, a, an individual who has wealth who might give money to help support a project. Um, and, um, you know, I'd done enough books, so I kind of knew what the process was, but it's a little bit shocking when you're actually responsible for every step of the way. And I always, I mean, I think the picture of me standing in the living room with 400 boxes, you should have seen me when I went down to the post office, right? Uh, they, they let me in an hour before they let customers in to start processing those books. And now I walk down, every time I walk into the post office, they're my best friends because we spent four hours doing doing all those books. So, um, you know, um, the other thing with doing books is that a lot of the publishers, they do the book, but they're doing many other books and your book is just one of many. And they're not necessarily putting the time or the passion that you bring to the, to the work yourself. Um, and, you know, they have to do a certain number of books and maybe your book fits in or they, they like the work and they want to do it. But, um, you know, after that, maybe they kind of disappear into what else they're kind of doing. Um, and uh, partly working with TBW, I felt that um, Paul's really committed and loves the photo book. And each book is really um, an act of love, if I can describe it that way. Um, he just puts in his soul and his energy and really thinks about it and the physical object um, and, um, you know, other books, um, I mean, these two books are, the, are my best book experiences. I mean, the one I did myself and the one I did with Paul. The other books, you know, you, you have a conversation and, um, you know, you wait and wait and wait. And then one day they say, okay, we're ready. And it's like, I've been waiting six months and now you're ready. And yes, and we have a deadline. And, you know, here's what we're gonna do for the cover. And it's like, okay, I don't like that cover. No, the marketing people like it. Well, what do the marketing people know about this or the audience who might buy this book? And, you know, I don't like the type. Oh, we don't have time to change the type. And, you know, it, it's, um, I mean, I love doing books and I think books are, um, as, a, as a photographer, I mean, I think they, um, they create your legacy of, the work that you want to share because so often a museum um, or a gallery, even camera work, you know, you only can show so many pictures. You're not going to show, you know, with Midnight La Frontera, you're probably not going to show 87 16 by 20 prints. Um, maybe you'll show a smaller selection or maybe it'll be a group show. And so the book really represents to me as a photographer, my vision of what this story is that I created. Um, and so both of these books really fulfilled, you know, that, that uh, the sensibility that I have about doing books. What do you think? Um, thank you so much for sharing that. I'm, I'm curious, you know, 
we're wrapping up 2020. We're hearing news stories about vaccines. You know, let's let's assume the world is getting a little better and 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 we can get out with our cameras again. I know you're busy teaching and you have other things going on. Where where do you think you want to go next? So you're working on this film, which I hope you keep us appraised of. We would love to share that when it's ready. But got to uh, raise a lot of money, Dave. If you know uh, any philanthropists who are watching, they can. Well, I, you know, now you're competing with us, Ken, because you know I'm asking. We need <laughs> the philanthropists too. But no, I, we of course we want to support that project. But I just, as we wrap up, I'm curious, what do you see yourself documenting uh, going forward as the world comes back? So, well, good question. So, um, let's see. Seven years ago, I started a project called Course of the Empire, and at that time, this was before Trump, I began to look around me and I began to realize that the American empire is falling apart and that there's this huge income inequality and I need to document this. So I started photographing. I traveled all over the US um, photographing um, the haves and the have nots. I mean, it's much harder to get access to um, the moments where people show their wealth but I was, I was able to find those things. And I, and I did this project um, and that project ran up until um, I did Trump rallies. And then I went to the convention in Cleveland and photographed the nomination. And that book was supposed to end with um, Trump's nomination. That was, that was the kind of the end of what I th thought the book was. And I worked with, um, I was really fortunate. I worked with Sandra Phillips and Aaron O'Toole at the MoMA, they were very, very helpful at looking at the pictures and talking to me. It was a lot of work. I didn't know how exactly to, you know, put it together. And, and um, those discussions really helped me figure out what that book would look like. And then uh, Gerhard Steidel saw it and said he wanted to do the book. So if you know Gerhard Steidel, the great German publisher, you know, you could wait a lifetime for him to do your book. He says, yes, I'm going to do your book. And then you just wait and wait and wait. So why I've been waiting, okay, which was, he, he told me this four years ago, and I'm waiting, I kept photographing. And so I have this whole nother, you know, I went, I went to the uh, Trump's inauguration in Washington and the Women's March. I visited the White House and photographed at the White House three times. I went to the Capitol and photographed at the Capitol. I photographed many different type of protests and you know, all different types of things. And now I'm kind of at the end of that journey. So um, I'm working on, I'm actually now kind of working on combining these two projects, the course of the empire and the second part, which may be a second volume, or I don't know, you know, called the history of now that kind of uh, documents this period, I guess I'd call it the Trump era of what led to Trump and then what happened. And that's kind of what I'm doing now with the book. And in terms of my photography, um, I'm, really, um, I'm really interested in uh, climate change. And so for the last three years, I've been photographing the aftermath of the wildfires in California. So I'm not a fire photographer, but you know, two days after the fire's over, I'm up, you know, Coffee Park, Paradise, Santa Cruz, I mean, all these different places where there have been fires, photographing. Ken, you know, we're grateful that you are there capturing those moments, um, whether it's those fires, uh, these moments in, in, uh, at the border that you captured in your book and, and those, those moments from long ago that seem so resonant now. I saw a comment from, from Chris Johnson in the chat that just, I wanna echo, that's very powerful, moving and important work. Congratulations, Ken, on this work. And uh, we look forward to seeing what's next. And thank you so much for joining us here at, at, at Camera Thank Work. you for having me, Dave. I really appreciate it. And, and I hope people will attend the Book and Zine Fair and support Camera Work because you guys are so, so important. Oh, Ken, that means the world to us. Thank you. I'm, and speaking of, of how you can support us going forward, I do want to call your attention to our upcoming events. Uh, tomorrow, uh, from 6 to 7.30, we have an artist talk with Adama Delphine Fuwundu and Orly Malka. Uh, Delphine had beautiful work uh, in our auction, uh, if you're not familiar with her, and they'll be doing a talk called Methodologies of Art Making Within Forms of Collapse. 
And then on Thursday, we've got a busy week on Thursday, um, Encampment My Wyoming, selections from the Laura Webb Nichols archive uh, from 1899 to 1948. And that's gonna be a really interesting talk with uh, Nicole Jean Hill. Uh, and then we have more things coming up in the weeks ahead. So please come to our website. These are all events tied to the Holiday Book and Zine Fair. And if you'd like to buy books from up to 40 different artists, uh, if you go to our website, click on the Book and Zine Fair Square and you'll be able to browse a lot of amazing books. We're linking out to the websites uh, of these artists' books, including Ken's. Uh, so we're just serving as a link routing you uh, to all of that. And then lastly, in this time of giving, uh, as an interim executive director, uh, if you're not a member, please join us. You can do that as our, at our website as well. Uh, and you can also support us uh, with a link at our uh, donate link on our site. We need your support, uh, especially now at this end of your time. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Christina Graber, for, as ever, supporting these events uh, and helping to produce it and making it happen. And certainly for all your work, all your work around the book and zine fair. Uh, my colleague and board president, uh, Michelle Branch, uh, was here, so I want to thank her for everything she does, and I hope to see all of you again soon. Thank you again for being here, and with that, we'll say goodnight.